Welcome to another episode of State of Play. I know it's been a long time since we last did an episode, but today we've got Stephen L. Carr, director uh, extraordinaire, editor extraordinaire. He's actually directing his first feature film. Uh, what's the feature film called? Splenetic. Splenetic is the feature. So in State of Play, this is a recap because I know it's been a while. We, or I, uh, talk to some of my friends and peers about side projects that they're making that represent their passion. So in this case, and usually the case, it's either a film or music or something like that. We've done uh, Connie Sue, which is a, she's directing a short film that I'm co-producer on. We've done Jason Kaufman, who is a musician uh, with Interstellar, who's doing the music for Changelings, the Shout short film. Jason. Shout out to Jason Kaufman. And then we've done Ken Stewart, creator of the Coca-Cola Bears. So that was a lot of fun. But today, Stephen Carr, uh, he is an editor. We work together on the Dead Files for Travel Channel. And uh, he has been piecemeal shooting his first feature film, Splenetic. Yes. Splenetic. And we're just going to talk about the process of making a film on your own, uh, piecemealing, kind of like I did with Milkshake. And then wherever that will spiral out, we will, uh, you know, we'll follow that train of thought wherever it goes. But generally, we're going to be focusing on Stephen's film. So anyways, take it away, Stephen. Mm. Okay, thank you, Phil. <laughs> I try to not be too formal here. Um, if you're drink, have a beer with us if you uh, if you want. It's gonna be about the conversation will probably last a little bit about an hour. Have a brew. Now, so it's a, a couple coffee. different brews here. <clears throat> Anyways, yeah. So, um, Splenetic. Yeah, what is like Splenetic? Uh, what, what first of all, what is Splenetic? Splenetic about? Splenetic. Well, the word Splenetic. I think I saw it in my Merriam-Webster word of the day. It had it had to do with like the the spleen. Mm -hmm. It's like just distasteful actions. I'm probably not defining that word as well as I probably could, but it's kind of... Uh, well, so, yeah. so having to do with the spleen means... Yeah, that's kind of the what it means. definition of it, but it's, it has to do with that sort of thing. The, and the spleen the, is responsible for producing bile, right? For yes, digestion and whatnot. Exactly, yeah. So, so the, the characters in this film are doing distasteful bile like activities <laughs> essentially it's, it's a story about a bank robbery that's gone wrong that's, so that's let, let, talk to me because the mic's yes. here sorry oh, yes sorry uh production guys production uh yeah so it's I'm about a bank to being on camera <laughs> so it's about a bank robbery gone wrong that's that's so, the real basic premise so yeah. take take me through the plot if you will i will try to be very brief because what actually, is what is the log line steve the log line is uh, Bobby, a man who is a uh, kind of a kind of a drifter. I don't say low life. He's not a low life. He's just kind of lost in life. He's when we first meet him, we see him uh, in his vehicle. He's still got his bank robbery mask on, and he's just robbed a bank. And he's has a woman in the back who he's kidnapped. Really, just thrown into the action. Just it's going crazy, fast action. It's loud. It's whatever. Um, and we follow him on his journey to uh, deliver this girl to the man he needs to deliver. Uh, Fresno Freddy is his name. Mm -hmm. That's who he needs to deliver the girl to. <clears throat> and why does he? Um, why does he need to deliver this girl? Um, he needs to deliver her because she has. Um, it, essentially, it's kind of a payback. Okay. For uh, uh, another character in this story, he's he needs to deliver this woman to him. Um, so it's about a guy who robs a bank. Yes. And in the process of it, ends yeah. up entangling with this girl. That's right. And really, where the plot gets kicked off is he, Fresno Freddy, tells him, above anything else, don't hurt this girl. You need to be really careful. But this guy's kind of. Bobby, Bobby Derry is his name. He's kind of a loose cannon. Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. He's kind of a loose cannon, and uh, he's a little wild. And in the kerfuffle of him driving, she's in the back in a in a in a in like a duffel bag, just going ape shit. He's telling her, "Shut up, shut up, shut up!" And he pistol whips her, mm -hmm. pistol whips the bag, the head in the bag. And he accidentally kills her. Naturally. So that's where the plot really kicks off. The plot thickens, the plot if thickens you will. Big time. Um, so he uh, he accidentally kills the one thing, the one person he's got to deliver to the big boss man. Mm -hmm. And now forces the uh, 
everything is coming after him now. You know, the, the big boss guy's coming after him. Um, he's mad at himself. He's got to deal with that. Um, and the girl in the bag, she may or may not get her revenge. Oh, so she, is she not dead? Well, it's something you gotta wait to find out. Phil. So a guy rob. <laughs> so just want to break this down. A guy robs yeah. a bank, ends yes. up having to kidnap somebody. Yes, and run and take money and kidnap a woman. And yeah. this is part. And kidnapping her is part of the plot. Part and the one the thing plan. he doesn't have to do is kill this girl. Or he just needs to he, deliver her. He safely. needs to deliver her. Yes. And he accidentally. Sorry, he accidentally kills her. Yes. And I'm assuming that this means that whomever he was going to deliver her to is now after him. And very angry, yes. And very pissed off. Yes. Now, why does she need, need to be delivered? Is that you want to save that for... I do. Yeah, okay. that's, yes, we're going to save that. But that's that's the essential plot. That's the basic outline of the movie. Um, so as far as, like, if you want to hear about location? Well, I want to know... Process? <clears throat> yeah. Well, the question that I got yes. went, uh, from... A, f- a fellow on Steam. Yes. Uh, but- another shout out to Ash. Uh, thanks, <laughs> Ash, for the question for yesterday's vlog. Uh, he wanted to know what what inspired the story itself because mm. it's because I'm mm. I'm on yes. Steam and I'm, I'm trying to raise money using cryptocurrency, so it's a bit. Yes. I'm choosing an unorthodox method of raising capital for the film, right. and it makes it that much more challenging. And so he was like, "Why would you want to make?" Essentially, I think he was asking, "Why why do something so damn challenging?" Yes. And what drives you to make this particular idea because it is so difficult to do on your own. And so I did Milkshake on my own. I think it took about 40 days to shoot. And I would say that the driving need behind that wasn't even the story because the story right. wasn't something like that needed to be told. Right. I just it wanted to food. make something fun. Yeah. I just wanted to do something fun. Your love of dessert. My love of milkshakes. chocolate and dairy, yeah. uh, cow mucus, if you will. <laughs> and um, so with Ash, you know, he asked me what's inspired Changelings. And it was definitely something much more motivated as, you know, into, as motivated by what's going on in society. Right. And although I don't, I don't think films need to have a justification in modernity and what's happening in society, because I think a film could just be a standalone fun thing. Yes. Uh, I want to know what has been motivating you to make Splenetic. Yes. Well, it had nothing to do with cryptocurrency, unfortunately. <laughs> Outrageous. <laughs> Uh, really, it was the personal challenge. So I've always, I came to Hollywood to be a filmmaker, to mm-hmm. write, direct, all that. And I'm a professional TV film editor, which is amazing. It's an amazing job. I love it. Um, but that urge, that dream to make my own films is always there, right? Right, right inside, you know, right at the surface. Um, and I've always wanted to make a film. I'm 39 now. I was 38 when I started it. Oh, I forgot I'm older 37. than you. 37. Um, Fuck. And I was like, <laughs> you better... Get on it. If you're gonna really do this, let's let's fucking do it and make make a movie. Yeah. You know? So I made short films but had never made a full feature. So it was a good a nice challenge to myself. Um and that was the real appeal of doing it. This particular story. Yeah, but um, yeah, why split it? What why drew that? you to because I've helped out shooting it and it's very stylized, it's very LA driven. Yes. It's very cool. Like the, sh- Part of the it. shots yeah. that we were getting were really cool. I yeah. enjoyed getting those shots. <laughs> uh, and they were reminiscent of doing milkshake because we were just driving everywhere through Los yeah. Angeles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, why, yeah. why a thriller? What, what, what mm-hmm. drew you to doing wanting you, to, wanting you to do a thriller? The real drive, as far as this particular story was, I wanted to do a film in the <laughs> in the woods, mm. the cabin in the woods, which has nothing to do with. Hey, film that's okay. I wanted driving to, around Los I Angeles. I wanted to do a sh- I wanted to do a series <laughs> about two idiots driving through Los, An- Los Angeles looking for a milkshake. Yes. So I you like like I said, I don't think there, need, there needs to be an important reason to do it. Yeah. But if all you wanted to do is to make a thriller and you like the setting of yeah, the, woods. the forest, yes. that's fine. Okay. Yeah. So so I have access to a cabin up near Yosemite. So it's like <clears> if I have access to this to go film something for a few days a week. I want to go film up there. It looks amazing. Um, and my at this time when I began filming, I began filming it October of 2017. Mm-hmm. So that's about a year and a half ago. So that's about how long, long it, process. Well, that's how long it took me to shoot Milkshake was like 40 days over 18 months. Yes. So just know that if you're going to make your own independent film, it's, you know, time, money, effort, all of the, the, the triangle right so the, change. there's something called the iron triangle which <laughs> yeah which you know especially when you're being when you're involved in independent cinema there are three things to consider that you you and you can only have two of only two. it is uh good fast good fast and cheap so you can either have good and fast but it will be expensive because you can't be cheap it'll be if you want it to be fast and good oh sorry if you want it to be good and cheap it'll be slow 
right. Right. So you can you. It's a way of quickly managing your expectations as to what you're able to achieve with the resources that you have. Right. And so, I think Phil and I are filmmakers, and the people watching this are people who want quality. They value something of of a different quality. They don't want something just kind of put out there without forethought. Um, yeah. Yeah. So so you so you're choosing you're you're doing the strategy that I did, which was. You want it to be good and cheap, but it's going to take a year and a half a to make. Time. Yeah, yes. a lot of time. Just get, getting the, the whole, getting favors from friends, getting locations you can use, cars you can use, actors who are willing to work for nothing, um, and that's what I told my main actor, Jackson, Jackson Palmer. Shout out to Jackson; he's been amazing. He, I needed someone who was going to be like a ride or die actor. Like you're going to come with me up in the woods for four days, just you and me. So the way I shot it was just me, camera on a gimbal with lav mic on my actor. And you and I are going to run around for four days. And I'm probably going to work you pretty hard. And you've got to be willing to just trust me in this process. And that's what we did. Mm -hmm. So October of 2017, we spent four days, four and a half days, in the woods at this cabin, just filming in the cabin, around the cabin, <coughs> Yosemite, the Yosemite uh, Park National Park is about twenty minutes away. We actually shot in there a little bit. Can you share any clips with me that we can share with my audience here? Of course, yes, it, we can. So we'll uh, cut away to that. We'll have a couple of clips that we're going to share. There's one in particular that I really like. It's <laughs> an over-the-shoulder shot of a, of the forest burning. Because yes. I think about a year or so ago, yeah. when you sh when you were shooting in the woods, that was about the time the other big forest fires were happening. Not yeah. not the campfire one no. that was just happening, no. but it was the what what was that one? That in particular was when we were driving to Yosemite. They'll occasionally do controlled burns. It was a controlled and burn. I think that's we don't know what it was, but we think it was a controlled. It's burn. Gor It's really cool. It's gorgeous. It's all what a shot of what a hundred frames a second or something. Yeah, hundred twenty frames a second. Thank you, Phil. It's beautiful yes. looking. Yeah. Um, so production wise, yeah, the camera I had was it, I shot have shot everything on the Sony A sixty five hundred. Awesome little miniature. So talk you can talk to me because the mic's yeah, here. So yeah, mirrorless miniature Sony DS DSLR. Or yeah, it's, it's it's what about yay big? Yeah, it's about super tiny, big, teeny tiny. You you would if you if I brought it out now you'd go oh they're shooting a vlog with this little camera but it shoots amazing, twenty four p four k footage, and hundred twenty frame a second ten eighty p footage it looks great. It's amazing. You, the lenses are amazing. Another big reason I chose this camera, I highly recommend it. Can recommend it enough. I did a lot of research. Is the autofocus on some of these Sony cameras is just bananas it's it's wild <laughs> bananas i love that phrase it's uh it's kind of <clears throat> scary how good it is you put a sony lens on this little camera and with the autofocus as you're filming on this gimbal whatever it will just track you it'll track your eyes and so i could just hold it in front of my actor and move around and do all these moves and it was just tracking his face which is it gave me a tremendous amount of freedom as a filmmaker to... wait does it does it does it track every eye or do you have to say do you have to point it at Steve and say, this is Steve, track these eyes? You do need to actually tell the camera. You have to physically tell the camera. This is film, Steve. Film. No, you okay. do. One, you need to point it at your subject. Like it won't, occasionally if there's another actor or a person behind your main subject, it can latch on to that person. But for the most part, okay. it's really good with tracking on your main subject. Yeah. So it was gimbal, camera, on the gimbal, which is like a handheld so yeah, so you got nice. a, for lack of a better phrase, knockoff yes. DJI sort of yes. Zen Muse uh, this gimbal, the right? the Ronin S. Yeah, it was called the Zhiyun Crane 2 is what I used. <laughs> it's amazing. Crane. It was like 400 bucks. Plop the camera on there and you just run and gun it all day long. I want to say that... All natural light. The only lighting I used at, thus far is camping lanterns. So I went to Home Depot and got a few camping lanterns. They throw out like as much light as this ring light. Or more, and that's what we used in the woods. Well, it's amazing that a cameras have gone gotten so sensitive. Yes, that you can use a lot of ambient light for what you're gonna, what would have required a lot of actual production lighting to to pretend to, to simulate ambient lighting. Right. And cities have gotten much brighter and much more efficient with their lighting. So yes. a lot of LEDs, but those LEDs are much brighter than say the sodium 
vapor or mercury vapor lighting that used to be the predominant lighting sources in cities. Yeah, the yellow I, light. I think you can even look at satellite photos. Have you seen these satellite photos? I think, uh, yeah. Where it's like you'll have yeah. half the city that's been oh, yeah, trans that. transitioned to LED and the other half is still sodium vapor. It's weird. That's so half cool. the city from uh, is like this beautiful pink. Yeah. Because like, sodium vapor produces this really pink yeah. uh, hue. And then the other half is this bluish, bluish. LED lighting. Yeah. It's really weird to see the transition. But yeah, the LED lighting is so half much the city's brighter. sleeping really well and half the city's just sleeping like I shit. Fuck, because I it's fucking hate <laughs> LED lighting yeah. in the city. I mean, it's brighter and it's good. Bright, you know, a lot yeah. of light reduces crime. It's, you know, it's much more efficient. But I love that pink sodium vapor, mm -hmm. especially in movies like uh, Collateral. Yes, yeah. I love the way that movie looks. Yeah. And I like how, I always like how Michael Mann's like, Oh, we could take this Sony camera and push it like film with everybody push, and it's yeah. just grainy and kind of looks like shit. But I still love it because he's just yeah. so enthusiastic about it, yeah. and the sodium and vapor looks great. And of course, Michael Mann, that was a big inspiration for the city. Some mm -hmm. of the city scenes we shot, we maybe show a clip of one of the one of the places we shot. Actually, one of the scenes that we shot that night was in an alleyway that he shot one of the scenes for Collateral, which is really fun to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. I we took a picture. Of, that's right. That yeah. was a. I was like, oh my god, this is. You, <laughs> wait, did you tell me and then I discovered it, or did I discover it? You told me, I think. Yeah, because you did this. some location scouting for yeah. that, right? I, I, that was that was the night that I held. It was very exciting. Yeah, I was like, ah, oh, this is where Michael Mann hung out for <laughs> maybe a couple nights. Yeah, just, um, it's a great film. I love that movie. Oh, it's such a good movie. I was d diverting here for a second. I was working on a show in two thousand four, editing a show. And in the same structure, Michael Mann and his editors were cutting collateral. I was like, oh my God. And they'd be coming outside smoking cigarettes and distressed, but they were working on something cool with Tom Cruise. And then finally the movie came out. Like, holy shit, this movie's great. Collateral, Tom Cruise, Jamie Foxx, check it out. It's a fantastic It's movie. a really good movie. Great it, script. You can find the, the director's commentary on YouTube. Yeah. Do you, you know, like, someone puts, someone puts all of Michael Mann's stuff, all the yeah. commentary on YouTube. Yes. It's fantastic. So that kind of goes circles back to the equipment and why I did this is there's just there's no more excuses. There literally is zero excuses for making not making your own stuff. Well, have you with heard your this phone with the, everything is just available to you. So it's sort of again it always comes back to the content itself. You know, mm -hmm. we have we all have access to word processors now and you can type, but who's really typing and who's making something, who's creating something and who's just kind of talking about it and for a long time, I was like, I'm, I'm sick of just talking about it. I want to make something, you know, substantial. Yeah. Well, that was so, the same motivation for making Milkshake was yeah. I was tired of making somebody else's material and not yeah. not taking the risk. Really, I mean, it was it was really about, I, just, I felt like a coward, yeah. <laughs> I guess for lack of a better phrase. Yeah. I felt cowardly that I wasn't taking the necessary risks to make the life that I wanted to happen happen. Yeah. And part of that, even if it, you know, even if I never made a dime making movies, it's just like, well, I grew up loving films and wanting to be a filmmaker. Yeah. But you know, I'm making unscripted television, and that's cool. I mean, I yeah. love yeah. making money, making movies. That's fun. Yeah. But be able to be able to make your own thing and yeah. to experiment with narrative form, uh, and to try to find an interesting story that is just not really out there to try to put something that you think is interesting and fun or funny or yeah. scary out and that you can say, oh, I did this, well, you know, and have that conversation. Right. That was I, another impetus to or another fun side effect of doing this was no notes. No one's giving me notes to do this. I'm making my own thing, but I am my, absolutely my own worst critic, my own harshest critic. It's That's kind of why it takes a long time too. It's like, is this, is this scene working? Does it make sense? Do I know what I'm doing? Like, what am I doing? I'll take you back for a second. Well, that's why I do everything drunk. Yeah, you need, you need booze. <laughs> not true. Yeah. Also, not true. <laughs> Just I, this. To, to Just di this. To divert, I've done dry January. I'm coming up on a full month tomorrow, so this is very weird. I tempted Steve with tempted. a beer. He said no. Very tempted. And I think we have Joe Rogan to thank for that. <laughs> I just want to say <laughs> that out there. He did sober October. He did sober October? Yeah. Did you, do you, did you Did you do No Nut November? No, I have not done that. <laughs> Never done that. <laughs> Neither have I. Yeah, apparently boxers that's for, have to do that. Because that's for pussies. That's right. <laughs> uh, I want to go back before October 2017, before I started shooting. So leading up to it, like in September, August, my wife at this point is like seven, six or seven months pregnant. So a month before shooting, I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? This is insane. Your wife is going to have a baby in two months. 
and you're going to go make a movie now? Like, what are you doing? And so that was another big, like, so, reason. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Well, she's like, honey, we have Lamas tonight. And you're like, babe, <laughs> I've got to go shoot a scene. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, my wife has been incredibly supportive. She's like, go do it. You know, take these four days to go up there and shoot this thing. Do it. Do it now. And so that was another big push to be like, I have got to do it right now. So uh, <clears throat> losing my voice all of a sudden. Do you uh, need some water? No, I'm good. I'm good. So that was another huge push. So having kids is a really good way to like motivate you to do more in, a, in an odd way. Yeah, it's great. Well, I imagine having a kid focuses your intentions very it clearly. It's a great way to say it. It does. Um, yeah, so that, that was the, the vibe <clears throat> in myself leading up to shooting. It was, it was like kind of nervous, but that fun nervous of like, oh, oh my God, this is really going to happen all of a sudden. My actor's in. He wants to do it. We got the dates booked. Like, I got all my props. Like, it's we're, we're actually going to do this. Like, the day before I left to go up to this cabin, I was like, I'm really going to start making a movie. Holy shit. And that was a great, empowering feeling. It's a good feeling. Yeah, you know, I, I'm sure you made movies when you were a kid. Like, yeah, in high yeah, school and whatnot. Yes. And, and there's something... When you're in high school or before... Because I started making movies in fifth grade with my yeah. father's VHS yes, camera. I did as well. And Stop motion. Fun, so, exactly, with Legos. Yeah, I did for with me. Star Wars characters. Oh, nice. Yeah. I did Legos. <laughs> uh, my, and my dad was... I'm sure my dad... My dad was like very impressed, the fact that I think I put so much effort into it. Yeah. But I'm sure it's at the same time, he's like, I'm a surgeon. What is my son doing? Uh... <laughs> uh but when you're doing stuff in, when you're in high school in your fifth grade, there's no expectations. It's just for the pleasure of doing yes, it. Yes, yes. I have to say, everyone, that is absolutely one of the best parts of doing this is you're just doing it for the fun of it. You're doing it because you love it. You really want to make something and make it good and entertain people and maybe affect them emotionally, hopefully. And hopefully it's a decent story. And you can just make it for the love of it, which is the absolute best part of creating something in Hollywood or elsewhere around the country. It's just, that's the best part. You're not doing it for any other reason but that. If something comes of it, awesome. If not, you've made something really cool. Hopefully, you know, yeah. <laughs> something interesting. <laughs> no shit. Yeah. Yeah, but that, that you yeah, doing it, when you have the opportunity to do the, when you, you know, when you look at the Iron Triangle and you say, it's got to be good, but it's got to be cheap, yeah. which means it's got to be, it's going to take a long Sounds time like to do. Sounds like a medieval torture device. It really the Iron is. Triangle. The Iron Triangle. I'm it sure is, there is. It's kind of like that, the, maybe. Well, there's the Iron Maiden. Yeah. So I'm sure we can make something of this. <laughs> but you, you, you're really motivated by your internal desire. There's no, you're not, yeah. you know, you're not, you're not, you know, you don't look at the market and say, well, we know that the demographic between yeah, 24 no. and 36 really likes horror yes. with these actors and we're going to put X amount of capital into it. You know, it becomes less of an equation and more of a, a, a desire. Yeah, we, Phil and I have talked about this before. Some of what we're like, we like to call our fireside chats, we, which is what we're doing now. We have fireside chats. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we should retitle this instead of State of Play, Fireside yeah. Chats. Fireside Chat number one. All Why right, not? Fireside <laughs> Chat number one. Uh, yes. So Robert, we've talked about this before. Yeah, so Robert McKee, story, amazing, screenwriting guru. You haven't seen what adaptation it's a, it's a really it. it's a really good book uh, great but I, I love that book and in there he talks about when you're writing writing from the inside out as opposed to the outside in and so much i feel like of our business tv film business is people producing scared developing scared from a fearful place They're like well, what's the market want what's x y and z network or film studio what do they want and we'll make that for them it's like no 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 do what you think is awesome and cool and make that. And people go, holy shit, that's amazing. Hopefully. That's like nothing. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully it's not garbage. Uh, and they're like, we want that thing. Um, I think that for myself is a much more interesting place to work from. Because I feel like you can kind of sense it. If something is being made because you're making it for what you think people will want, it never feels authentic. It never feels awesome i feel like there's always a hint of like i don't know it's just a, a yeah you know it's I mean? mechanical well i can give you mechanical I, more yeah. i can give you a example and it can be very cool but it's just you can tell when someone's making a passion project you get it you're like wow this is something else they're really going somewhere with this they're even if it's bad i respect that they're doing that because most people oh, yeah. don't take the step to actually do it beyond the black rainbow is an example of that i I I have not seen that. It's I don't like I don't like it as a narrative film. I don't think it makes a lick of sense, but visually it's exquisite. 
Mm. It's stunning. Mm. I, is it a short film? No, it's a feature. feature. It, wow. doesn't, it doesn't make any sense at all. But <laughs> especially if you're high, it's yeah. fantastic. But the, the visuals are spectacular. The director just did Mandy oh, with okay. Nick Cage, which huh. I love. Mm. You should. Maybe. Everyone should see Mandy. Mandy. Yes. It's really good. It's a. It's just an excellent horror movie. Mm. Um, but yeah, so you can you can definitely tell that it is a passion project. Yeah. But just to give an example as to what you're talking about, yeah. when I in 2006 I had a, a script that I'd written called Thunder Snow. <laughs> I love that title, Thunder which Snow, which been, is a real thing. I'm from Minnesota. Yeah. Thunder Snow is a, absolutely a real thing. Everyone, whenever yeah, when everyone got this script, they were like, "What the fuck is Thunder Snow? Why don't you call it Six Kids in a Cabin to Kill Themselves?" Yeah, it's very, it's it's very simple. It's, you're you're sitting in your house. It's gently snowing out. It's a beautiful, picturesque scene outside, and all of a sudden, yeah, thunder just. It's like you're in the middle of a huge thunderstorm. It's very weird. It's very strange. Kind of you cool. can find that on YouTube. Yeah. So I thought of this scenario of I just wanted to riff on the. Kids in a cabin who kill each other. Yes. In any case, it takes place during a thunder snow, so I just called it thunder <laughs> snow. But it was optioned a few times, and at some point, it had a million dollars attached to it. Mm. I had six hundred fifty thousand dollars in equity. Eh, sorry, six hundred fifty thousand dollars of private. No, I'm sorry, of company equity from Im- Imagine. Is it an Image? No, Imagine Entertainment. Not not no. the Brian Grazer one. That's Image. That's Imagine. No, sorry. So Image. So Image, Image. Entertainment was going to provide six hundred fifty thousand dollars of equity plus distribution, and then three hundred thousand of private equity. Right. And I asked them first of all, the guy who got started, Marty. He got started doing porn. Hmm. And I was like, he told me. In porn. He That's told me. He's sure. like, oh, I got started making porn. Then I was like, I was so excited because we were in, <laughs> we were in this big conference room, and I was like. Oh my God! You shot porn on film, <laughs> and he was like, and they were good movies too. Like he was so proud of. That could be the he, title of, of a porn movie. He Thunder was, Snow. It's, it's actually true. Yeah, <laughs> he was super proud of it. But then I, then I asked him, it's like, how do you how do you know how to finance these films? Like right. what? And he says, we have a spreadsheet of movies, mm-hmm. and we we have how much they cost and how much they made, and you know by genre, by actor, everything, and we can pinpoint. How much your movie Thunder Snow should be made? He was very mm. he was very open with me as just a filmmaker who didn't know they have an anything. equation. It's it's a it, there's a spreadsheet and in Thunder Snow fell into the category of six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's how they knew. Yeah. That's how much he knew to give. Right. Or my, to, give, my, to spend in my dark cynical place. This is where I just my eyes glaze and I go, Jesus Christ, that just sounds like the least. <clears throat> fun the least creative thing possible but i know that's that's the business part of the well you were running a business you, ha- like, you have like totally to that. understandable and I, yeah. I completely respect and you have to understand that stuff that. So you have to understand both perspectives when doing this type of thing because you can make your movie and just go sit and watch it by yourself in your basement but if you want people to see it you are going to have to deal with the business side of the business i like to yeah, say you true. know you always hear show business with a big b and that's true but if you don't make a good show no more business it's true. It's all yeah, gone. It's, You've got well, it's content reciprocal. is king. It's reciprocal. It is. It really is. There's always this battle between the art and the commerce. But, you know, sometimes people get a little too caught up in the money side. And then it's not so good, I don't think. I think people really are craving better. They're, this day and age with the Netflix, Amazon, you name it, you are competing against so much great content. You really have to stand out in some way. Mm-hmm. I feel like so I didn't mean to interrupt about your thunder snow. Yeah, but uh, but let me ask you: when they were offering cash and money, did their did the control start to slip away? Like Phil, you know, hmm, that lead actor, what you put in the script. Can we start? Sorry, can we start tweaking some of this? It's yeah. Like, so, then all of a sudden, yeah. the notes and the tweaking. When you start giving up control, when you give someone the the, the purse strings. Then they control the property, or they control a percentage of the property. They control everything. Let's just be very frank about this. Yeah. Uh, when I so yeah, so they wanted to make Thunder Snow. They were offering six hundred fifty grand plus distri- distribution. I mean, it was everything that I ever wanted. Right. It sounds like the dream, the dream, and maybe it maybe was. It's everything I ever wanted, except the note. When the notes started coming, I didn't know how to. I honestly, I didn't know how to satisfy them because they were right. asked. They were like, can, they're like, we really like the concept. But can it be more like the sixth sense? Right. And I was like, well, so so imagine cabin fever, <laughs> for lack of that, that, that's the first thing I can think of. So you know, a, a half a dozen kids go to a cabin, and begin to kill each other for whatever reason. Um, it's cabin of the woods movie. But then he's like, can it be like the sixth sense? And I was like, well, it could be, but it's not 
the movie that I wrote. It's right. an entirely different film. Right. And so we had, I think, two or three meetings. The last meeting being at Cape Mantellini, which is where Heat was shot. Oh, bringing, yes. Bringing it back to Michael Mann, which is no longer there. Great place. Cape Mantellini's Cape Mantellini. gone. Yeah. Wow. So that, that was that was it was actually it was it was a god it was like a dream a, come true. It was, it was kind of a cool diner place in Beverly Hills, Cape Mantellini's, but it wasn't like fancy fancy. It felt more like kind of like a diner. It was an overpriced diner. It was I mean, overpriced diner. for yeah. let's put it this way, a bowl of clam chowder was like sixteen dollars. Yeah, right. But it had so a kind of a cool look. It was kinda, awesome. Yeah, it was neat. I loved it. And the scene from Heat was shot there. This the yeah. scene between De Niro, and De Niro and Pacino, and they're talking about the black eyeballs. Yeah. And, you know that that whole scene where they confront nice. each other. That was Kate Mantellini. Nice. So I got to have a meeting. Yes. At Kate Mantellini, talking about my movie, and they're promising all this money, but the notes were impossible yeah. to resolve. And so I said, at some point, I said, "So do you want me to write you a whole new script?" And they were like, "Yes." yes. We want your idea. We want you, Phil. Right. We so I so I took their notes. And over the course of, I think I wrote a script in seven days. Yeah. No, nine days. It was a whole feature yeah. called As Long As I Live. Mm-hmm. And I had some help from another friend, uh, Jeremy Weiss, who's in the process of making his uh, first big horror movie. Mm. I'm not going to, I won't cool. won't reveal it now because he's still in the works. But he helped me write that script and I sent it to them and they read it and they were very appreciative, but it didn't satisfy the notes. As, as I, I, I put everything I could into it and it was... The dream of making my first big feature died with yeah. this, the with the notes process. Yeah, this happens a lot. I feel like in Hollywood. So if you're able to kind of, if you can, keep as much independence as you possibly can, it's difficult. If you want money, you're not going to have a, a ton of independence. But unless you're independently wealthy, but uh, it's tough. It's a tough uh, balancing act. But a lot of times too, with I feel like maybe with this, it's like people a lot of times in the business start to feed off of what's the hot thing right now maybe it was the sixth sense or like the the cool movie the cool show of right now and they're aiming towards that they're not aiming towards the new the next they're aiming towards what's cool right now and can we mimic what's happening right now which is infuriating it's like you just want to keep rehashing the same old thing no make your own thing man you Mm -hmm. know um yeah so that's tough it's like that's the dream getting the money to make the movie and then you Zip, you're giving up all control because now they con- literally control the property. Well, there's an interesting dynamic when it comes to money. The people who offer money think that their money is worth more than the property. Right. And they're not, it, it's not. It, granted, you need the money to make the property, but you can't, without the property, the money's worth Yeah, and the money's, it's like a promise. It wasn't like, oh, yeah. here's 615 cash. Yeah, on, there wasn't the a table. briefcase no. full of money. It was <laughs> it was someone dangling money. Maybe this will money. happen. Yeah. yeah, so, so that, so th- there's a, there's a disproportionate, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? A value placed on the money itself. The money is very important, but the property yes. is as important. Right. I think. So I mean, yeah, you know, there's so nothing you... to trade and sell if you don't make something, you know. Right. Um yeah. So so anyway, that's that's the the gist of Thunder Snow. Yes. Um it uh, you know, it it comes and goes it was optioned a so, few more times after so that. So what's what's its status right now? You it's, own the property, it's yours? It's mine. So, uh, good. I I keep I keep you know, pitching it at people. Someone's like, "Do you have a horror movie?" I'm like, "Yeah, check check out Thunder Snow." Yeah, and generally people like it. But um, after the, that was the only time it really came close to getting made. Just on title alone, it's, uh... <laughs> it's a it's a really interesting title. No, yeah. nobody knows what a Thunder Snow is in Cal- in California. Nobody knows what it is. Right. So I have to explain what it is. But in any case, that's a, that's that's an old project. That was yeah. just a way of highlighting. Yeah. The, the the notes process and, and yes. what that and you know and when you start getting into that place of, of people offering money how that changes the dynamic between right. the creator and yeah and don't get us wrong we're we're hardened industry veterans we know that the notes process is bad and horrific as it can be it can be awesome too it can really it truly can make a property better and a of lot course. of times that deals that has to do with your partners who are you dealing with you are you working with people you you respect and you respect their opinion and their taste taste is a big <clears> thing. <throat> Is someone pretending to be a producer, or is this someone with legit credits that really knows what they're doing? But there is, but there is a reason why Kubrick said he would never make a movie again if he wasn't producing it, yes, or controlling the money, right? Because he experienced sort of something similar to what I experienced on Thundersnow, but I forget. I think it was with Spartacus mm. when he took over on Spartacus because. Uh, Kirk Douglas was in control of it and in control mm. of all the money mm. that really produced um, an, 
a disfavorable climate for him to make a movie in. And so I think, I think, I think I could be wrong, but I think that that was the movie where he said after that, he said, I'm never making a movie again unless I control the money. Right. And this, you know, this day and age, there may be a few people, a few film filmmakers who, who have that sort of power, but it definitely is going to take some time and you're going to have to garner that kind of respect to, uh, have that sort of power and control over a property. But hey, if you don't, if you want to just do it yourself and don't take anyone's cash, then you can have that kind of control. I mean, but you really do. I remember a great book by Stephen King called On Writing. Everyone should read it. It's, it's a good, it's a good book. It's probably the best book I've read of Stephen King. Yes, actually. it's great. Ha first half is like a toolkit for writing, and the second half is like biography or autobiography. Um, but in there, he talks about. Uh, you need to know, at least when you're writing or making any creative property, you kind of know like at what level you're at. Like, is this a legit piece of work or is this kind of crappy? You need to be honest with yourself that you can kind of hang with the best of the best. Like, if you're going to really submit it to the market, is this really as good as maybe what's out there or is it you need some more work, you know? And I think you and I are probably more aware of than anyone. The more you do of something, the more you kind of question yourself and see the holes and the flaws in, in, in yourself and the story, like you start to, I think you have a better understanding of like potentially how good something is good, you know, um, or how compelling it might be. Um, I've been to a lot of film festivals where I love that people make movies, but there are some that are just, it's Dog a shit. agonizing. Dog shit. It's fine. You can say it. Short film festivals, you're agonizingly waiting and sitting through these movies. They're like, they just didn't have a, I don't say a clue, but they didn't have a, maybe a good barometer of how compelling their piece of work was. Or maybe they didn't get much out. Maybe they didn't get some outside opinion. It was maybe, you know, you, there's something to be said for getting an opinion of people you, you know and trust. Because if you are making something in a vacuum, it really might not be as interesting as you might think it is. You know, you need some kind of feedback from someone around you that you trust, a, a trusted reader, a trusted friend. Well, you know? I've, I have another friend who shall remain nameless at the moment because I don't want to speak for him, but he teaches film at a school that shall also rename, remain nameless, but it's a pretty big school. <laughs> and he says that um, some people just know how to make movies and some people don't. <laughs> and part of that is knowing that barometer, right? Yeah. So when you look at the landscape of cinema or story, ha some people are, are able to intuit what creates a compelling narrative or compelling mm -hmm. image or right. and it's some and some people require a lot of training like they might yeah. understand this is what i like right. but they don't understand why what they like resonates so they right. have to they sort of have to figure that out right. and and then some people just will never understand why two images juxtaposed to one another create a, evoke a certain sensation right I think be, it, uh, because cinema is really synergy, right? So I, yes. I, I, there was a vlog. I did a vlog recently about the music of Changelings, and that I I've heard people describe film as divided into three halves: picture, sound, music. Mm -hmm. Not three, not thirds, but halves, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the totality of them is greater than the sum of its parts. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's and sometimes people are able to intuit that totality between mm -hmm. picture, sound, and music in a way. That some other people don't understand why it evokes that feeling. Right. It's a. It's a. I don't know if it's a. I don't know if it's an, an IQ thing or if it's a matter of exposure to cinema or mm -hmm. or story or art from right. a very young age. I just. Yeah. I don't know. I think some people have a a natural proclivity towards artistic, maybe temporal arts, dance, film, whatever. And then if you get some training by watching movies, going to film school, doing <clears> research <throat> on YouTube, whatever, watching a ton of movies you can start to hone that lump of clay. Like you have a little bit of talent, you have some talent, you have something, you can start to focus and hone in on your voice, style, substance, story. Spielberg has said something interesting. He's like, I just, I happen to make movies that I really love and other people seem to really take to them. And it's like, yeah, big time. People love the movies he likes to make. And I feel like for myself, that's a big thing is just make the shit you wanna see. Make the movie I would go there, other show, whatever show I'm working on. I'm like, I want to make a show I would want to watch or a movie that I would for sure want to go see. Go make that. Thing. Yeah, I think that if you, you know? could, if you could confidently say, I would part with ten dollars of my own money mm -hmm. to see a move to see, see the this. movie that I'm gonna make, and I know that's sort of playing into the whole market 
thing that we say that maybe you should be cautious of or wary of. But if, if you could honestly say that if you're if you're browsing iTunes and you're like, oh, I'd spend three dollars for this movie, mm-hmm. and it's your idea that it maybe it's it's worth making just because you you know that you would spend money on it. Mm-hmm. That's something you would want to see. Yeah, and hopefully maybe other people might find that to be true as well, and they would join you in checking it out. Yeah, there's um, a filmmaker who did what's his name. Uh, well, the films uh, the films he made were Upstream Color and yes. Primer. Primer. What the hell's his name? Shane Carruth. Thank you, Shane Carruth. Shane Carruth, yeah. however you say it. I love his movies, and my writing partner hates his movies. <laughs> he just he hates them. But there's something about them that I love, and I feel a kinship with how he makes his films. He knows that mm-hmm. he would. I think I feel like when I watch his movies, they're the movies that he would spend money on. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. how I feel about his movies. They're Great. cheap, they're interesting, they're evocative of you know of, of bigger ideas, and I think they're, med- they're meditations on on ideas, mm-hmm. and I, I really like that stuff. And mm-hmm. so I feel like that oh like yeah if I if I made a movie like Shane Carruth's movies I would spend three to six dollars to watch that experience to mm-hmm. have that experience right yeah something I've always respected about Bill in our chats yes is his willingness to to kind of kind of diverting here but willingness to go make something to go actually do something like we'd be working on a show and he's like i'm making this webisode thing i'm just doing it and he's shooting every day by himself I'm like that's fucking awesome man not a lot of people actually physically take action and go do it like it's just mind-boggling how many people in the business just talk 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 and don't do anything yeah. so that's it's a very refreshing thing well um, i i hate to put I hate to be so negative on people who just talk, 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 because I do feel feel like people will write hoping and and, yes. and hustling for the chance to have someone make their script. Right. And and it's it's a different kind of mentality to take yes. take that script and be like, you know what, I'm gonna put everything on hold, everything on hold, and go spend every dime and every minute of every day that I have left over from work and maybe kids and whatever. Mm-hmm. To make this thing, making a real sacrifice, making it real. I mean, it's yeah. it's. A, it, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I feel like that. I'm just saying that there are people who, who put all their effort and time into writing, and it's not in their wheelhouse, or they, or they just don't have the sure. time or money to actually do it. Right. But I I think that I'm lucky enough to have the time, the some money, because I've got a nice, I've got a decent job, and I've got friends who are in the business who have equipment and expertise that I don't have that I could I could lean on them mm-hmm. to make those things. So I'm fortunate in that way, and I want to I want to recognize that fortune. But also, yeah. yes, if you want if you if you want to make stuff, and you you ha- and you say you want to make stuff, you have to make it. Yeah, that's the point I wanted to make is if you really want to make something, no one is going to come to you. No one's going to roll up the red carpet for you. <laughs> you have got to go do it yourself. And a lot. Of, when you start to do that, there's a there's a heat, there's a momentum around it. People start to start to go, "What's that guy doing?" That's, it's weird. It's interesting. It's super like, weird. People want to start to be a part of whatever you're doing because you're doing it. Um, you really have to find that burning desire inside and go do it. No one's going to come to you and and necessarily help you out. Although if you ask for help, people are amazing. People will help you in all sorts of ways. Yeah, if um, you sh- if you demonstrate that you are making something, be like, look, I've shot for 16 days. Yeah, I'm so close to finishing. I really need your help on this. And even if they say, well, it's going to cost a little, you have to pay me something, but maybe they'll give you a, a reduced rate on it. Yeah, people are can be are often are often pretty generous when it comes to yeah help, so long as it isn't asking too much of them. Yeah. Um, oh, I want to talk about a little bit about. My background is a TV film editor, so I'm used to seeing thousands of hours of unscripted, scripted, raw material, putting it together and crafting it, making it something something new, hopefully something cool. Uh, and what's so much fun about making your own movie is I'm a decent photographer, you film, you know, shooting. If you have some knowledge about fil- you know, using a camera, <clears throat> filming some interesting images with nice composition, um, you can really work those images. So I was really excited to shoot some awesome images. And then then editing, that's my wheelhouse. That's what I do every day. So it's like, oh, now I can play with hopefully really cool footage of my own and I can craft it any which way that I want. That was a really freeing feeling of, uh, of not taking someone else's footage, but taking my own. Um, and not always, but a lot of times how I feel about 
footage itself is that it's the raw material, it's the clay. And I think sometimes it's very easy to get wrapped up in just the image itself. And of course, it's super important, very important. You have to have an image, but it's real easy to get kind of just wrapped up in the image when there's so much more that's involved <clears throat> in creating a full piece of work, a story, a scene. It's the music, sound effects, pacing, um, reactions. So it's like getting the image in the can is like, that's just one small component of a much larger picture. Um, and I would say as far as like horror, thriller, whatever, sound is like, I think George Lucas has said this, sound is like 75% of a movie, and I agree, if that or more. It's like, it's so important to, if you have the right sound effects, you instantly place someone in that environment. You're like, oh, we're here. We're in a restaurant all of a sudden, or we're in a baseball stadium or something. And maybe like, think of like Blair Witch Project. The images are cool, but they're not necessarily this amazing HDR, 4K footage. It's like they really had to use sound or no sound to get your head and get the back of your mind into that story. That would be very creative about how to reel you in. Because um, you could have a flip book with characters, with little cartoon characters. And if you have awesome sound design, it's like you'll watch that all day long. You go, this is amazing. So it's like, I don't, don't get too, too wrapped up into, it's got to be spectacular drone shots flying over the Caribbean or something. It's like a good story. People will watch almost anything. You could almost have a, a blank screen with awesome sound design. And you might sit and listen to that for like a minute and go, this is really cool. Well, something... so, so think about that in your filmmaking, that sometimes the absence of sound or image is way more powerful than just blasting the audience with information, with image. Sometimes that's why black and white is really fun sometimes because you're removing information from the image. So it sort of draws you in. You want people to lean forward into what you're looking at to go, that's kind of, keep keep it a page turner. Well, to, that's kind of yeah, interesting. Curi to, uh, to evoke curiosity. Yeah, how do you get them involved in the image in some way? So sometimes removing sound, removing picture can be, uh, you know, can be your best friend sort of filmmaking jujitsu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that I would disagree a little bit only because I, there was all, there's I think something, I don't know if it was Lucas or for Coppola or whomever said it, but um, you, if, there's something I like to do occasionally, which is to turn off the sound from a scene that I'm watching and if I can understand what's happening in the scene without sound, yes. you know that the picture has been directed well. Yes, that for sure. The picture itself. Yeah, to right? just go for image, it's like that's pure cinema too. That's the silent movie days of you're just telling a visual story, which is, that is, that's filmmaking. That is. God, what movie was it I was watching like maybe a month ago when I was like, oh my God, this I could turn the sound off in this scene. I totally yeah. know what's happening. It's right. really well laid out uh, visually. Yeah. And that is really exciting. It's a big, that's a big thing. Like think about this a lot as an editor is keeping your audience oriented in the scene. What's what is the visual geography of a scene? And I know people like Spielberg and Zemeckis they obsess about this. Where are we physically in this space? Your people aren't confused about wait Phil's over here and Steve's here. It's like where are we? You know, we want to ground someone. So I feel like if you give an audience a moment to question something. As the movie or film or a TV show is playing, they're thinking back five seconds because they bumped on. What was it? What did I just see? Well, I think it's important to remember that when your audience is watching your picture, they are existing in three different uh, temporal realms. Yeah, and they're they're existing in the present, watching your movie. Yes, they're remembering the past as to what occurred, right. and they're projecting into the future what yes. might occur. Right, playing detective. What's going to happen? Right, and so you as know? a filmmaker, you really have to find a way of balancing, and you, it, it it comes down to the visuals typically. How do you set up expectation, resolve that expectation, play with the expectation for right. the projection, and mm -hmm. then how do you keep someone in the moment, which I think you do touched on a, a little bit ago, which is having someone lean into it, the, generating the curiosity as to moment-to-moment mm -hmm. moment what's going to happen next. And how can you break expectation? You're like, wow, I was right. not expecting that. You turn that on its head in a new and interesting way. Right, and you you know, everyone knows, as soon as they understand, as soon as, they, as soon as something happens in a picture where they're like, well, wait a second, 
that's when you've severed mm -hmm. the continuity right. from the past to the present to the future. Right. And you really can use all those tricks to your advantage if, you know, you have to be very discerning about it. But you can use those tools to reel people in. And subvert fun. expectations. Yeah. I really feel like the, with the best books, any sort of creation, books, movies, TV, whatever, when it's well done and well crafted, you feel like you're being held by like a nice guiding hand. Like, come with me. Hello. Come over this way, Phil. Come uh, with me. Come with, I'll, let me take you around this dark corner. Mm. We're going to see something real fun. <laughs> yeah. But it's like really like you're like they're bringing me somewhere and I trust them enough to be like, I'm going to come with you. I'll suspend my disbelief. We're going to go around the dark corner and I want to see what happens because I know you're going to take me somewhere interesting and I'm going to maybe feel something or what I like. I feel like some of the worst stuff is you get the sense like an uneasy sense in your stomach that maybe the filmmakers don't really know what they're doing or they didn't know where they were going. <laughs> Um, or like you hear a line like, I don't know what's happening in, in the dialogue. And it's like, yeah, maybe you don't really know what's going on. And then it's like you feel uneasy because you're like, I don't think they're going to take me somewhere satisfying or interesting. Um, yeah. So that said, uh, with yeah. your film, yes. how are some of the ways that you are playing with expectations? Yes. Well, let me. Or are you? First, or is it totally straightforward? Let me first that? talk about just because my head's there. Okay, talk. About actual what I've done so far. Okay. So it's been a year, year and change, kind of like 15 months about. Um, I've shot, I think, for like eight or nine days total, which isn't a ton, but in each of those days, I'm getting a lot done. Like a lot has been happening. Um, so it's been interesting that what I shot in the cabin in the woods for four days, I thought that was going to be the whole movie. And then when I started cutting it, I was like, oh, I'd like to fill in some gaps here. I want to get it to a full 70-minute runtime, and it needs... It needs some holes filled. So what's been fun is I kind of have it that structured out, and I've been able to go back and kind of backfill the story with what I think could be really cool scenes and shooting them after the fact and then inserting them into that overarching structure from those original four days. So that's been the process. When I'm available, the actors are available, um, we'll go shoot for a day or half a day. Well, how many days left do you think are required hard to say i would say maybe a week maybe five days okay. i think i can do it probably all in about five days but finding those five days like i have a, a a little child she's 14 months old so it could be anywhere between five weeks and five months that's right totally and you know you have a family you have work obligations you're busy your time's limited anyway so to find that schedule that time and then your actors or the people you're working with your crew have lives too so to find that exact time can be pretty tricky. And that's the thing about the Iron Triangle with fast and cheap and good is you have to find that balance. If you want it good, you're going to have to take more time. The actors have to make money somehow. And so it's a, it's for sure a balancing act. It takes, takes that effort. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of effort. It, but it's, it's really mostly fun. just like a lot of effort. A lot of effort. But it is really fun because you're just kind of playing in your own playhouse, which is cool. And a lot of times you're playing in someone else's playhouse. And it's really fun to be like, no, I'm playing in my own space, you know, which is cool. And you, you kind of get to look at yourself in a different way. You go, that's interesting. Why did I choose to do that? You know, what am I thinking and feeling here? And yeah. Kind of now, you know, you've been like milk with milkshake. I self financed it. Yes. Are you now you're self financing completely? Splene Splenectica? Splenetic. Splenetic. S P L E N E T I C. Splenetic. Okay. Thank you. Splenetic. Um, uh, completely 100% self financed. So, Are you, have you thought about taking what you've self-financed and trying to crowdfund something to get like a concentrated number of days hmm. to really finish it out? Because you've got, how many days have you shot now? 10 or 12 or days? Maybe almost 10, 8 or 9, something like okay. that. Okay. Yeah. So, but if you could take what you have now and say raise an extra five or 6,000 bucks, yeah. even if it was just that much, which isn't a lot, yeah. to say, okay, guys, we're going to take these five days and just really finish mm. it. Yeah. Have you thought about that? Yes and no. Part of me is like, I, with this project, I've given myself kind of limitations. I'm a big fan of the law of creative limitations. Like you say, give yourself like, I'm only going to, so I've told myself, you're only going to shoot with this particular Sony camera. Only natural light or camping lanterns. Like very strict rules for myself. Like dogma, kind of. Like, kind of like dogma, almost, yeah. And part of it too is like self finding out you're going to do it. this project in particular, 100% self-finance. But I think for a future one, maybe. Maybe for... Yeah, to, to give you that extra, really 
the money buys you time is what it buys you is what that's what it gives mm-hmm. you uh, we have the technical skills, Phil and I, where being an editor and knowing knowing some camera stuff, we can do it ourselves, but you need other people's time to help you realize the vision. So you're kind of, you're paying for people's time. In right. Your own well, time. well, that's, yeah, well, that's why I have to crowdfund for Changelings is I think that in order to get the, the, the necessary collection of skills together for the amount of time, I think it's going to require a little, little extra cash. When I shot Deceit, uh, I only paid, I think, two people on set because uh, because it was so last minute and there was nobody that would do it yeah. for nothing. Right. And I had to pay a couple of people. Yeah. But with changelings, I can't, I can't risk not having my effects supervisor right. on set or right. my DP on. I can't, I can't afford that. So yeah. this time, I've got to actually try to raise a little capital yeah. so I can actually pay people to right. to show up. Yep. For four straight days, yes. and maybe they'll give me a day of reshoots for nothing, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it, they're reshoots. It's a right. short film. There's got to be some level of give and take and understanding. Yeah. That there are only so many favors you can pull with yeah. people before they're like, "No, fuck you. This is I'm not going to continue to work for free." We we both done that in the past, and that's a trap sometimes. Oh, sometimes. Yeah, by the way, I just want to quickly, if you are shooting for free, yes. One way to really make people feel appreciated if you can spend money anywhere is food. Yes. So that is a huge thing. If you're not paying your actors and your crew, always, 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 always say everything, is food is on me. Your meals, craft service, if you need gas money, that's on me. And make it very, very clear up front before you begin, I cannot pay you, but I can pay for your, for your food and your gas. Yeah. For and like with the seat, I had, we had a hot breakfast Hot dinner, hot lunch, yes, n- tons of snacks. I think ten percent of the entire budget for that short film was food. Yes, feeding people is probably like number one. Honestly, you have got to feed your people and your crew, and treat them well because they're working very hard for you for free. Yeah. So you know? if you can't, if you can't afford to pay them a salary, you just make sure you have great food, and people will feel like, oh, you know, the the honestly. One of the biggest compliments I got on Deceit wasn't how... Am- I mean, I thought the movie was good, but it wasn't like, oh my God, the, ma- the day was amazing and the film was amazing. It was, oh, the food was so good. It was. So- <laughs> I just I just was always full and I felt happy. Yeah. And, and everyone walked away, or everyone that I everyone that I know, a lot of people that I talked to walked away feeling satisfied that they were appreciated enough to be fed well. Yes, super imp- crucial. Um, yeah. Hmm. Mm-hmm. This good, fireside good chat, chat is going well. It is. It's fun. What a- <laughs> we how need to have an actual fire here. How much so. is, this has been going on for what? 60? You know, it's about like, an hour. Close okay. to an hour, yeah. Wow. Um, so, I mean, is there anything else? We probably should wrap it up soon because we're running out of, out of card space here. But if... Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think what else. So, mm-hmm. if, um, so my, my goal with the movie yes. is... Because you, you do need to give yourself a deadline, I believe. Wait. When you yes. so as far as goals, yes. When you plan on releasing it, when you plan on finishing it, and when you plan on releasing it. Yeah, my goal is to because I don't have any particular end goal with it as far as like how the people are going to see it. I'm de- I'll definitely submit it to festivals. So I'm like, okay, the Sundance submission deadline is the fall. It's always like October. It's mm-hmm. always been like dream like submit it to just who knows what's going to happen. Submit. It. So I'm like, it has to be done by October of this coming year. So October, 2019 have it just have it done like have everything shot finish cutting it do a mix on it whatever like do all the finishing work and submit it to the festivals by the fall of this year it seems like a long way away it is not a long way away that will come up very quickly yeah very i've got quick. i've got i've given myself 90 days to to work up to the crowdfunding of changelings and i was like oh my god i was thinking about on the, on the drive home today oh sorry yeah on the drive home from i went to the nam show today and, and the drive home from anaheim I was thinking, okay, I've got 85 days. Oh my god, that's nothing. I've I've got to move. I've got to get this sizzle written. I've got to get the I've got to start shooting everything. It's going to take way more effort. I don't know. I was just reminded that the 85 days is nothing. I've got no, to really not. move to get the sizzle complete, the crowdfunding complete. If I can do some interviews, all that complete while maintaining the YouTube channel and these the, the daily vlogs and and state of play if this is going to be a regular thing, which I'm hoping it is. You know, all these things have to be kept going. And meanwhile, I have to complete this project that is about as complex as making the film itself. Yes. So I'm doing 85 days of prep work with the vlogs and budgeting and scheduling and shot listing and, um, re- you know, rewriting and location scouting. 
that, you know, and I'm documenting all that on the YouTube channel, that itself is as much work as those four days will be for the film. Right. It's, it's, it's 90 days to show I can do four days. Right. It's fun work. to hear about this process because Phil and I's process is very different. Phil is very much like ordered and structured and he's spending 85 days on scheduling the movie and funding uh, and this, where I'm very much just like fly by the seat of well, my pants. That was Milkshake. Yeah. When I did Milkshake, I was like, you know, fuck it. Whenever, whenever <laughs> we can shoot, can you do it this weekend, guys? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. So we would, but with, you know, but with change, you know, I, I need to raise so much money right. that, that to leave it to uh seat of your pants would be yeah. probably for lack of a better phrase, irresponsible. Yes. You can't, not every project can be that way. It could be, uh, it could backfire. It could be awesome, and it, it does not impart hopefully an energy to the footage because you're like you gotta get race through stuff, or it could be like yeah this doesn't feel fully thought out, or it could have been ten percent better, you know. So it's it's a balance. Yeah, well, I don't, I because you do have to plan. Having a plan, you need a plan when you don't have one. So you have got to have some sort of backup plan. Like when I went to go shoot, like it's a lot of work to. Get, make sure all the props are ready. My actors are going to be there at a particular time. Like it still takes lots and lots of planning to pull this stuff off. It's not just like you go out with your phone. And you're like, all right, it's perfect. No, it's it's going to take some real work. Well, I, yeah, I in the I did a vlog entry yesterday, and part of it was, or was it plan, yesterday? Or did, I, whatever, number four or five, plan for success. So with milkshake, the way that I planned for success was I bought my equipment. So that if anything, I knew that I could go and get pickups yes. and we could piecemeal the, the tiniest of segments of scenes. And that I, and I, in other ways, the planning for success was that I was going to be editing it. I needed to ensure that I could complete the project. Now, there, there, I did make a terrible error on Milkshake, which was I didn't back up one of my drives. Um, well, as I was backing it up, rather the drive failed and I lost five days worth of shooting. So yes. that's why Milkshake is only eight out of it's 10 a horrifying episodes. horrifying story and that can happen, especially with all this digital media. It's, yeah, I backing think the, footage up is huge. Just backing and backing up only cried. Back up. I've only cried twice in my life. When my father died and when I lost those five days of shooting. Yes. I mean, it was it was that devastating. Yeah. So, in, so I did not plan for success when it came to backing up. I was not diligent and how, and, and enough. Here's the, how did that happen? Because it's very simple for something like that devastating to happen it was like something like i was like oh I'm gonna well go i was away. i was putting all the drives i yeah. i had i usually the, the way the way that you usually do it is when you shoot you come home that night back it up right back, away back back it up right away or and on I, set whatever and i didn't you know I, I just was tired because i think the last day of shooting i was finished at four in the morning and i was like oh, i'll just do it tomorrow and tomorrow became a couple of weeks instead of doing it that night and so the day that i was going to shoot the first episode of Darkness Calls, I was sending all the drives up. I was like, okay, I'm gonna set this to back up. I'm gonna, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna take eight hours to back up. So I'm gonna do this and go shoot this thing. I put the drive in. I was, I was, I was editing episode nine and I heard a bloop and I looked at my desktop and the drive disappeared. And so I was within minutes of setting the whole thing to back up, but it was all because I broke, I broke protocol. I broke the, yeah, well, I guess the protocol is when you when you copy all the footage, you copy it twice the night you're done. And I just got tired, and then I sort of forgot. And then the day I remembered, it was too late. And so plan, planning for success is something that goes along with any big budget or small budget. But with small budget, it's much it's much more critical. Yes, because um, you're going to get tired. You're going to get exhausted. You're going to get cranky. You're going to get happy. You're going to get well, all those emotions you're feeling. You're in the moment with the actors and the scene, and it's like... You also have to be paying it in the back of your head. X, Y, Z is a time to eat right now. Do I have that prop? Do I have backed up the footage? It's a lot of, there's a lot of balls in the air. And when you're not, when you're doing it yourself, you're responsible for all the balls. There's no mm -hmm. one else. There's no production manager. There's no assistant director helping you out. It's you. It's yeah, all on I, you. I couldn't blame, I couldn't blame anybody. <laughs> yes, which is a that. wonderful sense <laughs> of like. Horrible. <laughs> yeah. Personal. It's horrifying. And it, what's awesome is it's like, it's like extreme responsibility. You are, have full ownership of everything that you're doing. It's all on you. It's like you've got it. I think Sam Mendes, the director, said, it's a director, whatever, you have to have broad shoulders. Like, if it comes down to you, you got to be, yep, it was my mistake. You have to be Atlas. You do. You really do. You have to carry the load to, to say it's, it's on me. You know, this is my thing. And so that's also a very freeing thing. You know, it's like you're your own boss. Yeah, but... To use another god, or I guess that was the Titan, but to, yeah. to use another Sisyphus. god. You know, well, not Sisyphus, Mercury. 
Yeah. So you can either it, it's falling on your shoulders, but if you fly too close to the sun, your wax wings melt. Your yeah, Icarus. Yeah, Icarus. Thank you. And I, that's that's what I you know, that I experienced both the the responsibility and the freedom of being responsible for it and the yes. pleasure that that brings, but also the sadness the weight when you of screw the responsibility. up it's yeah. so it's so awful yeah it's, and, i feel like it's interesting i feel like with doing it yourself the risks and the rewards can be both greater they can be like they're more the extremes are more extreme it's like if you really hit that success it's like amazing and it really shit that brick whatever yeah if i screw up at work really screw up if i screw up at work it's just, you know even if it's a sort of semi-major screw up there are redundancies in place to save you um and when you don't have the money to have those redundancies in place, any mistake becomes catastrophic. Yeah. And also, and because it's your responsibility, you know that there's no one else you can point the finger at. Yeah. It's just, it's very painful. Right. If you lose. And it's a good, the other good feeling is that it's a real sense of accomplishment. It's yeah, like if you knowing, win, if you finish it. Yeah, or at least a, accomplishing, mm -hmm. finishing the goal of filming something and completing it. It's like, you really did it. And you maybe have fears right now. Like, I don't know if I can do this. And we all have those fears. And you're like, no, let's take the first step. And slow but sure, inch by inch, anything's a cinch. And you, <laughs> you can get it done. You really are finishing it and making a movie. You're like, oh my God, it's happening. It's always hardest right before you start. That's the worst part is like just thinking about it. Just take the first step and do it. Well, yeah, you, you discover that the water's not that cold. No, not at all. If you will. Yeah, and it's fun. It really is. Yeah, you jump the, in. The whole it's like, oh, fun yeah. of doing what we do is to actually, it's the process. For me, it is for sure the process. The shooting, the editing, the sound design. That's what the fun is. It's so much fun to do that. It's powerful. It's telling a story is really powerful. It affects people. And... To have that sort of creative control over something is is really fun and cool. You know, we're very lucky. But now these days, anyone can do it, literally. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, let's. Um, I think we should wrap it up. Sure. Yeah. But um, next time we do this, we'll have maybe a couple of cameras. I'm not sure. We'll yes. see. Maybe we'll do a little more formal. Yeah. But uh, I thanks for hanging out, guys, for yeah. this episode of State of Play. I. Anything that we've got, anything, you know, anything we've talked about today, we'll put it in the description below. Tell us, you know, if you're making independent films on your own feature short film, let us know what your process is. And Steve, if you can tell us where we can find you yes. and yeah. your film. Yeah. So number one, thank you, Phil. This has been awesome. We're going to do it again. Thank you everyone for watching. If you want to, my personal Instagram, if you want to follow some more personal stuff, but if you want, it's at Stephen Lee Carr, S-T-E-P-H-E-N Lee, L-E-E Carr, C-A-R-R. And if you want to follow the movie, I only have one photo up now, but I hope to post more. It's Splenetic the Movie. So S-P-L-E-N-E-T-I-C, the movie. Those are both on Instagram. And what about uh, for your editing one? Do you have a personal site for that, like a professional site? Editing? No, I don't. I don't have a professional Steven editing Steven just site. gets calls. He doesn't need a website <laughs> no. or, a, or a resume. They just yeah, call him. Oh, no, yeah. Um, his it's, name uh, floats around. Yeah, he, yeah. he materializes. To, you know, <laughs> come out of the vapors. Yeah, yeah you have to go to the, in front of a mirror and say his name three times. <laughs> he'll show up to edit your movie. All right, Candyman, Candyman. Yeah. <laughs> Steven Carr, Steven Carr, Steven Carr. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, thanks for hanging out with us, guys. Be sure to check out Changelings as well. Uh, link to that uh, below. Be sure to follow me on Steam and on... I guess I'm on Instagram as well, but not really that much anymore. But Steam is the, Steam is the, the place I'm usually at, or minds.com. Steam. Yeah. Steam. <laughs> Anyways, have a great week, and we will see you soon. What do you think? Uh, was it a month? Yeah, I think once a month. We'll see you in about a month. Yeah, we'll see you in about a month, and we'll, hopefully we'll keep this conversation going. All right, guys. Catch you later. Phil and Steve out. <laughs> access to everything I do and access to my private Telegram channel where you can ask me any question you like about the process of making changelings with cryptocurrency. All right, see you there.